Glory to God. Let's read something while we remain standing from John chapter 4. Again, I'll be brief this morning. John 4, and I want to start reading from verse 21. John 4, 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You know not what you worship. We know what we worship for. Salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23. That's where I'm going. But the hour coming now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh. If your Bible is yours, underline the word seeketh. That means the Father too is seeking for something. That's a, a strong word to use on God. That God is also looking for something. He says, seek and you shall find. But then God is seeking for something. The Bible says, the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. I want to begin this morning to start talking about worship. God is a spirit. And they that must worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Matthew chapter 4. Thank you. For our, now you can have your seat. God bless you. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus Christ. We go as far as we can go this first service. And then I will continue next service. And if there is the third service, I will continue. <laughs> okay, the Bible says, verse 2, and when he had, let's start from one, then Jesus led up by the spirit to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So, it is possible for the spirit of God to be leading you and for Satan to still be tempting you. Hallelujah. Okay, so, Jesus Christ, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, or when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of, of God. Next one. Then the devil take him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Now, Satan himself is quoting scripture. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said, It is written again. Satan said, It is written. Jesus said, It is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then, the Bible says the devil take him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, all these things I will give to thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus, Get thee and Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. A louder one. Amen. I hope somebody didn't come to church this morning to come and keep quiet. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, Jesus started. They forced him to learn from that passage. You don't respond to the devil by ignoring him. You respond by responding. Every word he spoke to Jesus, Jesus spoke back. It is written. It is written. It is written. So that is the first lesson. When dirty thoughts are coming to your heart, you don't try to use another thought to override the negative ones. You speak with your mouth. The only way to respond to Satan is by spoken words. 
Now, we do not know whether he appeared physically to Jesus. But what we are looking at today, when he made the first temptation, Jesus responded with the word. But when he got to a crucial point where Satan demanded worship from Jesus Christ, then he said, at this point, our conversation can no longer continue. Get behind me. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and only him. No other person you shall serve. All through the Bible, there are few things recorded that God experienced in the Old Testament that God really, really hated them in the Old Testament. Very few things. On top of the list is the first commandment he gave when he came down, Exodus 19 and 20 of Mount Sinai, and he said to them, Thou shalt have no other God before me. The first commandment he gave to the children of Israel. Why is this so crucial? That as Jesus began to converse with the woman by the well, he brought this topic up again. That God is a spirit and is seeking, is seeking, is seeking. Why? Because worship is very scarce and is very expensive. Can I hear amen? Worship is not slow songs. <laughs> worship. Now, every church uses the word Sunday morning worship. But I tell you the truth. 90% of what goes on, 99% of what goes on in all churches, including this one, many times they have nothing to do with worship. So let's begin to redefine worship this morning. How deep must this thing, how deep is this thing that even Lucifer said to Jesus, I am willing to give you the whole world, the kingdoms of the world, if you worship me. I don't need you to do any other thing. Jesus, you have come to take the word from me. I took it from Adam. You have come to restore what Adam lost. But I am willing to give them to you right now if there is an exchange. You worship me, I give you everything. Why did Lucifer demand worship from Jesus? To freely give Jesus everything that he had. It's because from the beginning, all he wanted to be was to be like God, and he fell. And the whole essence, everything about God, is rooted in one thing, worship. What is worship? Hallelujah. Amen. The first time the word worship was used in the Bible, Genesis chapter 22, no connection to any song. Something happens to you every time you worship. And worship takes place in the innermost being of the house of God. Or in this, at the center of the kingdom. Worship is cast and worship is expensive. That's why the father is seeking, seeking. There are billions of people on the face of the earth. But when the father is worshipped, he recognizes it immediately. Because it does something to him. Human beings crave for different things. God craves for worship. There is praise as the outer court of worship. But worship is the center, is the holiest of all. It is something expensive and something scarce. We are going to look more at the second service. This guy said, let's read Genesis 22, and that is where we start. There is something in the Bible that is called the law of first mention. In other words, scholars do say, when you want to know the original meaning of a thing in the Bible, go to the first place it was used in the Bible. So if you have a Bible concordance, the first time the word worship was mentioned was concerning Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac. It came to pass. I think go to verse 4 or so. God, then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his hand and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, I abide here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. 
I will not fully enter this message this morning, but permit me to say a few things. Listen. The first step to worship, Abraham being the father of faith, he was going to sacrifice Isaac. And at a point, he said to, there were many people following them. And Abraham said that, all of you stop here. When it comes to worship, it's a private matter between man and God. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Abraham said to all the other guys, their company, you can follow me to praise. You can follow me to many things. But when I'm about to worship, I have to leave you behind. It's a very private affair. Mm. Revelation chapter 4. The last two verses there. And then we go back to Genesis. Are you following me this morning? Yes, sir. Very soon you will understand why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God is able to deliver us. I think that's Daniel 3.20. Even if he will not deliver us, we will not bow. I will speak more this at the second service when David prayed and prayed and prayed that the son should not die. In 2 Samuel 12. And the son that Bathsheba gave back to died. When the son died, David got up and he went to worship. Worship is expensive. Let me say this about it. What, when you don't feel like, and what you don't want to let go of, they are the things that you really need to worship God. Is somebody hearing me? Sorry, Revelation 4. Yes, please. The last two verses. The 24 elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever. How? The next thing is very important. Casting their crowns before the throne, saying, they were enthroned elders. Honestly, this is not a familiar term. This is a very deep message this morning. It's not a familiar terrain. It might not be a message that people will enjoy. But those who will get it, something will open up in your life. Amen. Are you with me? They were crowned elders. What qualified them to be elders were the crown upon them and the throne on which they sat. But when they needed to worship God, they removed the crown and placed it down. If the crown of your life is not removed and placed at the feet of the master, you have not worshipped. If you don't get up from the throne which you sit, that means... If there are things in your life that are not, so another language for worship is absolute surrender. When there are things in our lives that are not yet at the feet of the master, you are not yet a worshiper. Worship means a total surrender to someone that whatsoever you like, do with me, I am yours. My body, intestine, everything I owe and all that I will ever be. I have received crown. I'm a man. I'm a father. But I am saying everything that I have accumulated, including my life itself, I lay it down before you. That is worship. So when God wanted to start with the first man, he looked at Abraham and he said, do you know? So many Christians have not come to the point to realize, and this is why there are very few worshippers, that everything you are and everything you have belongs to God. This is why songs don't move him. We sing these songs, but in reality, we don't do that. I will begin second service to talk about idols, God's definition of idol. Listen to me. If I pray to God for a wife, and I'm married, and it begins to diminish my worship, my time for God. I have made an idol out of that woman. And you know the way things work in life. Anything you seek for, when they come into your life, they quickly try to displace God and take the center of your life. Check it very well. A woman can pray for a child for years and get one. And then the reason why she's not praying and do what, sorry, but it's because of, a person can pray when they are broke and get blessed. And now they have DSTV again, there's no time for God again. Thou shalt have no God before me. You already have. And by its nature, it's a jealous God. God doesn't feel jealous that you have. He doesn't care about your car or anything you have. But whatever stands between you and him becomes an idol. And God hates idolatry with everything in him. He, he doesn't like to see idols at all. 
So one day, he gave Abraham Isaac. Then one day, he said, let's check whether this guy is a worshiper. Then he said, Abraham, can you give me that son, Isaac? Abraham was working with some men. At a point, Abraham told those men that, you know what? You can't go beyond what I'm about to do. You might stone me seeing me doing it. It was too deep for too many eyes to see. He said, so stay back. And he took Isaac. When they got to the top of the mountain, God was sure that not even Isaac would stand between him and God. A voice came from him that now I know. Remember Abraham's journey started with God from chapter 12. It was in chapter 22 that God said that now I know. Now I am convinced. Listen. <laughs> in Genesis 19, 18 and 19, as God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he stopped by in Abraham's house. And the angels were walking, of course, they didn't tell him their mission before. As Abraham stood before God, God said, shall I hide my plan from Abraham? He said, I know that it shall become great. He said, for I also know that he will command his children to work out time so we can show him this plan. God knowing you is at levels. Now, in chapter 18 and 19, God said, I know Abraham. I know that he will command his children. That means I can trust him. To... But then in chapter 22, God said again that now I know. That means the knowing of chapter 18 was a small one. There's no doubt about the fact that you are born again. But believe me, she said, there are arenas of God that only worshippers can cross into. At that point, you have become, Romans chapter 12, a living sacrifice before God. Do you know, <laughs> people wear expensive clothes. And they cannot kneel down to worship with it. I belong to you, Lord, everything I belong to you. And to walk away from your phone for one, one hour to worship, problem. You know, we come to church. Our lips sing. Our heart is very far. Only few people, genuinely, break down every Sunday before God in worship and do the same when they are at home, worshiping God by themselves. God is merciful. He copes with us and he tolerates us many times. But many times, what we do, that was what Jesus did, the woman did with Jesus with that expensive perfume. This thing is so deep. There is no worship that you offer that will not shake you. And we are going to get into some examples. In new, uh, maybe I will start second service. It is impossible to worship, not to know. So that means it's not song. Hi. An offering that I give that is convenient for me is not worship. An offering that the Father speaks to me to give, that is worship. Are you getting what I'm saying? If I praise God every Sunday as it is convenient for me, it is not worship. When God told Abraham, he woke up early in the morning. Worship is never convenient. For the flesh, it will tear your flesh. And you know what? You need your flesh to tear for your spirit to come out. It is called releasing the supernatural. Hallelujah. Are you getting what I'm saying? If it is convenient, it's never worship. Do you hear what I've just said now? Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I don't know how many times the elders were doing that. They could have said that we worship you, Lord, like we do on that. But first of all, crown must be removed. Because when the king of glory stands, no other person should stand. All else must fall down and worship him. And those who worship, they worship with everything that is in their possession. They took their crown, put it down. They stood up from their throne and went down to say that thou art worthy, O Lord. In other words, this crown is because of you. This throne is because of you. And I need to walk away from my throne to be able to worship. Everybody has the sound of my voice. You have a crown, you have a throne. Your crown can be your job or different things. God wants to get every believer to a point where there is nothing in your life that you will blink an eye if the Father says, bring it. You have become a worshiper when God totally, not by what to say in worship, uh, in songs of worship, but in reality, when God becomes the true possessor of both you and everything that you have. So he can demand my time. Use 
You want to watch a match, and the Lord says that, sing to me right now, and switch on that TV. When you are singing and you feel like singing, that might be praise and God can enjoy it, but it cannot satisfy his heart. Like when your flesh wants to do something and God says, no, I want you to worship me now. Let me tell you the truth. Golden moments like that, if you stop missing them in your life, revelations and visions and encounter with God, they will be your daily schedule, daily things, if you start this second part. There will not be any Indian question in your life that God will not be able to answer. I told them on Wednesday, a hard gospel. Reverend John was telling us of a guy. As he was praying, the Lord said to him that by my plan for your life, I don't want you to marry. You are going to be a missionary and could cross terrible places in the world. And I don't want you to turn a, a woman to a widow. And he said, yes, Lord. He's almost 60 years old now. Never married. He moves from one village to another. And he's yet, I mean, he, he, he goes for terrible areas. He goes, <laughs> you know, I'm going to talk about David's second service. I have seen believers. Someone lost a child. And she's angry with God. I won't pray again. That means two things. You don't truly believe that it was God that gave you that child and that God is the owner. That means you have become the owner. When the service ends, whatever you have accepted ownership of, in the kingdom, nobody owns anything. You only have access. Democracy has robbed us the idea of kingdom. In real kingdom, that's why Yoruba will say, can't be all see. You don't question a king. He owns everything including you. So rights and privileges are in democracy. But in the kingdom, the king gives all of you access. But nobody claims ownership. Because in the real kingdom, the king owns everything and he owns everybody. If the king says, die now, you, you, you have to die. I get what I'm saying. When you see people get angry because they have lost something, it means that they have never, they never believe that God owns it. It's true. How many things do you possess right now? And when we are singing, you're singing, Lord, everything I have belongs to you. Even your guiding angel is laughing at you. He knows very well that it's a lie. We will see in David's second service. The child died and the guy got up and went to watch. Have you really come to a point where you realize that this life, this life that you have, including the clothes you wear, everything belongs to God. Some songs, can, you, can only, you can only sing some songs and it will make sense in heaven in your moment of pain. Don't waste pain at times. There is a worship that can come. Oh, yeah, but I can't see, too. see, I don't want to get ahead of myself. That was what produced Solomon. It was the death of the first child. Ah, I feel sorry for those who get angry with God because something. So, I, I, one day I read and I made up my mind never to complain again. They said that Meshach and Abednego said that our God is able to deliver us, even if He will not deliver us. So, we are here. I heard of a missionary that they killed all his children and he's still staying back in that place preaching. And then somebody's complaining because a guy walked away from you. Say, Lord, I pray that I should not go, and he has gone. Now I'm not saying, you, you. <laughs> ah, people hearing me this morning. Your car, your bank account, your native, your liver, kidney, everything, it belongs to the king. Hallelujah. When your hands are up in worship, can it be a genuine thing coming from your hearts that there is possibly, Lord, what will ask me that I cannot give to you? There is nothing you ask me to do that I can. There is nothing I cannot walk away from for your sake because you own everything. And there is nothing that leaves me that will make me be bitter towards you, Lord, because you own everything. Everything. The moment you are sent to this level, your job has become an object of worship to God. I can tell you the truth. Right now, for everybody listening to you, both here and online, maybe over 97% of us, most of the things we have, they are our own. And this is why at times when we pray to God to move on our behalf, it's a little difficult because 
Everything belongs to you. Even though you say in your mouth that, Lord, it belongs to you. But God knows that, no, it belongs to you. You have never handed it over to the king. He didn't need Abraham's son to die. He just wanted Abraham to pass that mark. That nothing. Lord, even Isaac that you gave me, I waited for 99 years to have Isaac. Even though it took me 99 years to have this guy, if you want him in a day, I will give him to and I won't blink an eye. Then God said, now I know. He said, tell him, in blessing, I will bless you. You have finally convinced heaven that I am the almighty God. You have no idol in your life. Nothing competes with my space in your life. That was what God was saying to Abraham. How many people can God be there his chest and say that about? Worship. You know, anytime we kneel down, we begin to sing. Because everything in Hebrews 4.12 says that, 13, all things are open in the eyes of him that we have to do with. When he looks down, he sees everything. He sees what our lips are saying, and he sees what our hearts, how much ownership we have over our life. How we want to go to where we want to go to. You know, <laughs> for many years, I thought it's not a convention, but it's not a teaching, I'm just talking to us. For many years, from when I was taking on that scripture, and I've seen guys and ladies debate what you should wear and what you should not wear. It is because many people have never met the king and they have never offered him their life. So they dress themselves. So people still argue, I want to wear that, I want to wear that. See, a time comes, the king tells you what to wear and what not to wear. Hallelujah. That is when he, you, 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 you have come to accept that my body belongs to him. So it's not mine alone. So I, I don't begin to claim ownership and start trying to. That same we also saw in the days to come. God forbid. Yeah, you have cancer show up in your body. Everybody prays for you. Nothing happens. It's your body. So heal it yourself. Because every time the spirit tries to tell you something, you argue. No, it's my life. Yes, it's your life. Then don't ask God to control it. We are in control of too many things. And you cannot be a worshiper that way. A worshiper means someone that is totally surrendered to God. Everything. And exactly what Satan said to Jesus. When God finds a worshiper also, he gives the whole world to them. It is true. It is when we get to heaven that we are going to fully understand what worship does to God. Honestly, I know that it sort of opens up a part of it. Worship does him in a way that woman language cannot explain. He craves for it. But he knows exactly what he wants. He's not looking for songs. Otherwise, those who don't have voice to sing will not be able to worship. Ah, I bring you more than a song for the song in itself. You remember that song? It's not what you have required. You search more deeper within. That is the truth. I heard the story of the church where it happened. The choir became so good until God left them. They were too good for God to use. And they repented when that was when that song. Actually, worship will always put a new song in your mouth. Hallelujah. As a result of a private transaction between you and God, there are names of Jehovah you will discover that nobody knows. Can I hear me? Amen. David wrote many of those Psalms in trying times. But as he offered worship, a revelation came. You think all that we know about God is all that is to be known? There are revelations that God will give to you personally as a result of private encounter with him. Yes, it is true. You see, as we move into 2021, as we begin to ask God to do this and that for us, can we also begin to ask God, what exactly do you want from me? What manner of woman, what manner of man do you want me to be? What do you want from me? Many years ago, I realized that there is a way that Simeon writes unto a man. I will never accept to go anywhere. I will never accept to live anywhere or to do anything if it has not been endorsed by the Lord. I know it to be an effort in futility. This is a very deep message, and I'm going to stop here. I will start second service with David, and then we we'll look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
That must have meant that I'm about to sing that song. Casting crown, lifting hands, bowing hearts, not bowing head. I love the word bowing hearts. A heart that says that this is how I want to go. But my king, if you say I should go this way, you own me. That is the way. You know, I've, I've said this before. Yeah. The reason why they will say that if you want uh, the highest blessing, you give one million, lowest one, 500. I've been in meetings like that. If I want to give, I give. I don't respond to all those things. It is because of the scarcity of worship in the church. In the time of Moses, when they were giving the commandment, Moses called for an offering. There was an overflow. He had to tell them to stop giving. In the time of apostles, the Bible said that they came and laid everything at the apostles' feet. People had land, sold land, and they brought the money to church. Why? They believe. I'm not saying what I'm saying. I'm just saying that they got to a point where they all believe that everything I have belongs to God. Everything. Let me give you an example, which I said about two weeks ago. In the early days of the church, we were just having a service. We were just about maybe 15, 16 members then. And I was so tired that they going home. And then somebody gave me a thousand or so. And then I branched uh, in that TFC. I used to like TFC a lot then. So I bought rice and chicken. It became my joy and my consolation. <laughs> you know, I fasted Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, expecting that we'll get to church on Sunday. I will be like 50 people. But we're just from 16 to 14 that day. So it's very discouraging. I have preached in this church alone. I was the only one that came for service. And towards the end, one of the pastors, she's not yet, she just walked in. And she said, so where is any, everybody? An empty hall. And I said by faith that they are coming. I felt bad on my way home. I said, Lord, it would have been better for that first time. Which first time we joined the church that the pastor is the member, is the prayer coordinator, the praise worship day. I said, Lord, I was okay that I was the only one in the church. Last week, about seven people came to me. I said, why didn't you bring her when they were At least you will see other six people. But you brought her when I was the only one. So, <laughs> on my way home that day, I was so sad. We were just very few. So I bought rice and chicken, and I was entering the house. I was staying in Shola, Shola, that Shola over there. I was staying in his house then. And there was this, their gate man, a Fulani guy, and his, uh, his little daughter was out there with her hijab and everything sat. And I heard that voice. As I walked past the girl, he said, give that food to her. She just knelt down at the gate like this, looking hungry. He said, give that food to her. Honestly, if God said I should give my car, my clothes, my, my tabinesia. The idea, I was too tired, discouraged, just wanted to land on the bed and sleep. I was, ah! It sounded like give your liver to that girl. I, I first of all walked past her that, no, I would rather say that in the evening, I can go out and buy and store the food. But you see, the Lord was not interested in my bribe. It is the will of the Father. Yes, worship me now by doing this. Is somebody getting to understand worship? Yes, that is more than a song. There's a satisfaction that reaches heaven when you obey like this. Abraham did not sing any song. Jehovah, you are. It can be a little expression of it, but that is not what it is. Otherwise, Abraham wouldn't call him worship because there was no song. Oh, Callisto, is somebody hearing me? And I, I, I turned back and I gave her reluctantly. And she did not waste time. She took it, looked left and right to be sure that her father, her father was not around. And ran to one corner and devoured the whole thing. But as I moved, the body lifted. Hallelujah. And joy came. Have you felt evil smiling over you before? Yeah. You don't see the inside the body. There is a knowing in your heart that they are just happy with you over there right now. Worship. Hallelujah. Do you know there are people listening to me, both here and those who are watch, watching me? You are in a unit that you love to be, not in a unit that the Father wants you to be. Even in serving in the church, you are in a department that you love to be. Yeah. Maybe you love people to hear your voice and see your appearance, so you want to join choir. 
But the Father wants you to join sanitation. <laughs> Amen. Let me end it this way. The deepest language of worship is not my will but yours. Hallelujah. Not as I want it but as you want it. You know what? He just wants you to prove to him repeatedly that you are the king and I know. That's all. What that does to God, we cannot explain. But somehow, it is, it is, it is something, it, God derives so much satisfaction in the fact that there is an issue and you bow down. Okay, you know what? You are the Almighty, you are the Lord. I am the subject, I accept. Do you know Jesus said the same thing? Father, let this call pass over me. He said, but not as I will, your will. I don't want to go through this cross, but if that is what you want, fine. He just wants to sit down on the throne and hear you recognize that you are the Almighty. Everything. Oh, during praise worship at times, you are tired, you want to sit down, then you remember. He owns my news, he owns every part of my body. My hands are up in worship. He holds me. Sometimes you are shy to dance in public, but when you realize, what is the reputation? What's my reputation? Who are we dealing with here? Almighty. One day I was listening to a message by a man of God, and he said that people have reconciled with God on their deathbed, sick, sick, sick bed, more than any other time. Must it take God? Because for many people, it is when they are finally down. Oh, go to hospital and see how people seek to worship God, how they become attentive. They don't mind a little boy coming to lay hands on them and pray in that time. But they get that point. They are, they, can't, they are now immobile and they are finally recognized that there is a king and they are not in charge of their life anymore. Look at yourself. What do you own? What are the things in your life that you are the owner. You are the owner. If you have a God, then you can own anything. One day I was talking with Apostle Selma. You don't know what God tests people with. And he said, as Koinonia was growing in Kaduna, after praying for many years for them to grow, they too struggled for it, and then they started growing, growing, increasing. Then one day he heard a voice. Can you hand over this fellowship to me and walk away and go and become a member who has nothing? Because it feels good when you're a pastor of a big church and everybody's following you, you know, everybody loves you, everybody respects you. You come in, choir is fantastic, like we saw the carol service. Everything wonderful. So you have all the cameras now, you have all the equipment. And you come in with people listening to you. And God says that, can you resign and go and become a member? Or walk away and go and start something else and don't take anybody with you. Become a pastor again where two or three are gathered. When you say yes, Lord, it means that you re God is more important to you than the congregation. Congregation can be, that was why God rejected. See, this thing I'm telling you, I saw one day I sat down and I did a comparison between the sin of David and the sin of King Esau or Shegogo Mama. But you see, you are not God. You don't see the way God sees. We have to see. Are you getting what I'm saying? David took a man's wife, arranged for the killing of the man, and God forgave David. What did Saul do? Did he have a good reason for what he did? Samuel said that I will come in seven days. Samuel gave a time. Till Saul waited till the time lapsed. Samuel didn't show up. And he offered a sacrifice by himself. He didn't kill anybody. Didn't sleep. Saul never slept with any woman that was not his wife in the Bible. And God forgave. Because what pain God was that Saul put the people before him. And he did it two times. Go and wipe up the Amalekites. He did it the second time. See, so this is why in the house of God, if you put people before God, you want to sound right. You want to be loved by the people. You want to be honored by the people. You want to be in people's good books. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. So just the people, the people, the people. I usually tell you that if you are appointed a leader over a unit and the person you are reporting to tells you something and because you want to be right with your people, let's say choir now. And they say, ah, no, what, that, what pastor said is not really, let, let, let's move the time to, and you listen to them, you have lost your leadership ability that day. It must never be 
All the people in the church cannot move me against what God tells me. Before everybody came to us, me and him, and if everybody goes, it will still be me and, me and him. The only one you cannot offend is God. Hallelujah. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, somebody says somebody should be a household leader or self leader. All of a sudden, he's listening to the people he's leading more because he wants to be right with them. Error. You are operating the spirit of Saul. He will cast you out. He will forgive a fornicator and not forgive you if you do that. It grieves the Almighty God. He said to Sam, Samuel, prayed all night long, and God told Samuel in the morning that you have just wasted your time. Take a jar of oil, go and anoint a guy. He said, You don't know the way I, Almighty God, I feel. I would rather forgive the one that is for, for fornicating around than this one that places, because anytime you place anything before God, it becomes your idol. I sat down and I said, Lord, ah, let, let's look at this matter now. You should have forgiven Saul now. But God showed Samuel, the first time Samuel prayed, but God said, okay, I'll give him another chance. He said, but Samuel, I want to show you something. The problem of Saul is that people are more important to him than me. Do you, have you felt like dancing before? Then you looked at people around you, and then you decided. If you don't, you are, naturally you don't like dance or anything, then there's no problem. But if you are only considering people around you to determine what you do and what you will not do, ah, you know, I've met people before. Not in this church. I met a friend. We're in school together. Husband told her to stop going to church. And then she stopped. Is somebody hearing me? Thou shalt have no God. Mm. Let's rise. It's all blessed this morning. When you are going home, how are you going to worship him? When you get home, how are you going to worship him? Sir, have you seen the job that you do as a worship unto him? Or you think it's your job? Who owns your time? Who owns the resources around you? Who owns your time? Let me tell you all of you here. You don't need any pastor to tell you that give this or don't give that. Ask God every now and then. Don't play tradition with God. Don't get to a church where, don't get to a church whereby every Sunday, you know how much you pull out of your pocket and then you just give. Why don't you be a worshiper? Nobody needs to tell you anything. Can you ask God, I am going to church. It is your money. It is my la your life that is in me. What do I do in church today? Lord, I want to join the units. You made me and all the talents in me. Where do you want me to function? Yes. Can you take it to the point where you wake up? Lord, what do you want me to do today? It's your life. I am alive because you made it so. Those who operate this way, premature death and all these things will be far from them. It's yours. Oh, money is song. It's yours. Hi. I will never forget a friend of mine in second in University of Ibadan. Who oh, struggle, struggle, struggle to impress beautiful girls. He was on scholarship, was very handsome. We had dinner three times and he won the best dressed male three times. And he was the only one of the few students with he had a car. He was on state scholarship and he was a medical student. One of the most handsome in the fellowship. Yet all sisters were saying no. And I, immediately I found the reason. As a medical student, as brilliant as he was, he used to wake up every morning to pray for two hours. You see, the closer you are to God, the more he would demand that you recognize the fact that he is God over your life. So I told him, I said, you know what? You are trying to impress this girl. You, now, one day he, he took me in his car and as he was driving and he said something about the last girl that said no to him. So what's wrong with herself? That she should even be lucky that I'm asking her out. And sincerely, if you put the two of them down, truly, he was right. He was far brilliant, a better cause. He had the car and everything. And I said to him that day, and he repented. I said, see, that is why they are saying no to you. You are approaching them with the fact that I'm on scholarship, I'm a medical doctor, I'm on everything. I said, by strength shall no man prevail. Two of those girls said yes to somebody that was not up to his level. Somebody that used to come to his room to even listen to counsel from him. He was shocked. I said, you have not asked the creator Take off your crown and put it at his feet. 
Indeed, he's happily married to another daughter and they are abroad and they are having a good time now. Take off your crown and put it at his feet. When you are standing before the Almighty, you are a nobody. He is the only one who is to be worshipped. Hallelujah. Are you chasing life? You are chasing life. Turn back and ask the king, I worship you. This song I sing, it all belongs to you. And lift up your hands and just worship him. Sing the song. Belongs to you. You can look at the words and say them. It's important you say them. Hallelujah. Just wave your hands to him. When the meeting is over, if there is any aspect of your life, God doesn't condemn anybody that you feel like you are still in control of. Can you just hand it over to him? Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life. I live for you. I live by your rules. I follow your ways. Oh, I surrender my will to you. I surrender my will to you. My job belongs to you. My time belongs to you. My body belongs to you. My children, my everything belongs to you. We worship you. We give you praise. Oh, thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for grace to lay it all at your feet. To follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Hello, thank you for watching us. We don't want this to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You know, um, after listening to God's word like this and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's an opportunity to come to him and it's a simple process because he has made all things available. I want to employ you now to give your heart to Christ. And by saying these words, because giving your heart to Christ must be done consciously. He has paid the price. Say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you shed your blood for my justification. I accept your finished work right now and I confess that you are the Lord of my life. 
I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have said those words, you are actually born again, a new creation in Christ. Join us for more of this. God bless you.